everyone doing today? <laughs> Great. All right, I'm very excited to be here uh, to talk about brainwaves. Um, great, so my name is Alex Castillo. I am a software engineer at Dropbox. And I help, uh, I build software to help understand human behavior. Uh, that is what I do for fun uh, outside of work. And today I'm going to be talking to you about neural JavaScript. So who here has an idea of what that means? One person? Right. I'm impressed. I don't even know what that is. So mirror JavaScript is a term uh, that I put together, you know, two very uh, common words. It's actually a combination of things. And the things that I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, are going to be related to, to this, right? So mirror JavaScript involves isomorphic JavaScript, which I'm going to be covering today. It involves neural technology, data science, data visualization, and open source. So a lot of different topics here, and each one of them actually deserves uh, a separate presentation. So I'm going to go into as much detail as I can the parts that I think are relevant for uh, today's talk, right? Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about JavaScript, mostly uh, you know, server and client side, but with AngularJS uh, and ES6, and also a little bit of TypeScript. Um, and also, we're going to be talking about the brain um, and the internet of things, uh, or how I like to call it these days uh, for this talk is the internet of the brain. We're going to be uh, exploring a little bit, very little bit of data science and machine learning and machine training. That's actually uh, not too much of the scope of this talk, so just bear with me. Data visualization, definitely we're going to be covering uh, two dimensionals and three dimensional visualization on the browser. And lastly, but not least, we're going to be talking about open source, but you might use mostly open source on the software side. We're also going to be talking a little bit about open source on the hardware side. Uh, and I'm very excited um, about it. Great, so the OpenBCI dashboard is the project that I've put together. And it's what I'm going to be demoing today. And it's going to touch on all of the things we talked about. Open source, isomorphic JavaScript, data visualization, and everything else. Uh, and we're going to see how Neurotech uh, applies to all of these technologies. I want to start by talking about OpenBCI. OpenBCI is a company, actually, here in Brooklyn. Uh, and it stands for Open Source Brain Computer Interface. So if you hear me just saying the BCI, the BCI, that means the Brain Computer Interface, which is this guy right here. Um, OpenBCI is based in Brooklyn, and they have created the first open source brain computer interface in both software and hardware. So if you go to their GitHub um, uh, organization, github.com slash OpenBCI, you're going to find a lot of projects, mostly involving uh, the creation of, um, uh, of a brain computer interface. So you'll be able to find files that are, let's say, um, 3D objects that you can actually print yourself, then buy some parts, and actually uh, put together one of these for your own use. They call this the ultra cortex. And the ultra cortex is actually a 3D printed brain computer interface that is mostly made out of, of course, 3D printing materials, but it also has some electrodes in here, which are the metal pieces that you can see. Uh, this one in particular has eight channels. It means that it has eight sensors, and from eight different parts of your head, right? So the surface of, of your head, we're going to be capturing electrical impulses. Because our head is full of electrical impulses, right? Um, we're going to be capturing this today, and I'm going to show you how that looks like all in JavaScript. This part here in the back actually uh, is uh, the OpenBCI board that you can actually see is pretty simple or pretty small. Uh, it has a small battery in the back, but this communicates via Bluetooth uh, to this dongle that I actually have right here uh, that connects to your computer via USB. These are some of the parts that you can buy 
um, and then plus the, pr the pre printed parts, you can put this together. So actually getting started with a brain computer interface, it's pretty simple. A simple NP install of MBCI SDK uh, can get you the dependencies that you need in order to start getting data from this interface via Node. How many of you are familiar with Node or are using Node right now? Oh, love it, awesome. Great, um, if we define um, an OpenBCI variable or constant, right? Um, we can get access to this SDK that was actually built uh, by a few people uh, from a company called Push the World, um, and some of them are just have partnered with OpenBCI company uh, to bring this technology to the to the JavaScript world. And ultimately, what we're going to be getting out of this uh, is a data packet, right? Data packet that looks like this, actually very simple, has some, just several properties. Uh, we're going to be getting a data packet every four milliseconds, uh, which is a pretty fast rate considering, right? And to zoom in, uh, you can see here that it just looks like a normal JavaScript object, right? That's what you're going to be getting every four milliseconds. You're going to, you're going to be getting some properties about the bytes, um, the sample number. Um, that the channel data actually corresponds to each one of the channels uh, from the headset. So you're gonna get a value in four milliseconds where in a voltage, right, in that array. Uh, and it starts from like channel one, two, three, four, five, until channel eight. There's some auxiliary data, though, you know, we don't, we're not going to get into that uh, just yet, but actually uh, you can do a lot with it because you get access to SLM or data out of the box. Um, so the way these electrodes are placed is using the 1020 grid. Uh, and if you see it like this, this part being in the back, you're going to see how we have channel 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. So you can say that the left side of this interface is gonna be the odd numbers and the right side is gonna be the even numbers. This is very important to have in mind because sometimes you're gonna see the data and you're gonna see how there's more activity in one hemisphere of the brain versus the other, so having that in mind uh, actually helps a lot for research purposes. Great, it's demo time. So I am going to need a volunteer to come here uh, and get their thoughts extracted. <laughs> All right, I think you, no, it's not fair. You put together this conference, come on. All right, uh, you. Actually, do you have a small head? <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, they, they're actually three, three different sizes. You know, come here and, and we'll give it a try. Yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to put you in a spot. Yeah. Thank you. This one happens to be a medium size. Uh, how are you doing, sir? Good. I'm Alex, nice to meet you. Yeah. Dan? Thank you, Dan. It takes a lot of guts. I wouldn't have done it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the reason why I asked the size of your head, it wasn't to make fun of you, is that there are three different sizes because we don't have the same size of head, of course, but uh, let's just put it on and let's see how you feel comfortable or not. If your head is too big, unfortunately, maybe we'll have to uh, bring someone else, but let's get it back. So, as you can see here, uh, we have the, the sensors, the electrodes are a little spiky. It, it's normal to feel like a little bit of spikiness, but the two in the front are flat, the ones that are gonna be placed here, all right? All right, let's get started. You've never heard so you doesn't be out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, pretty good. I, I think you have like the perfect, perfect size. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to make sure that you're feeling each one of the sensors, okay? I can see contact here, maybe a little less. There you go. And these are kind of, these are just like screws. You, you can actually like take them apart. Uh, there's actually a little tool that helps you adjust it. Uh, a lot of the ones that you're gonna feel are just plastic. They're just for comfort, just to sit on. But these two look fine to me. 
Uh, number three here, use a little bit more rotation. Number four here as well. And then we have the one here. Is it comfortable or uncomfortable so far? It's fine. It's fine? All right. So I like it here. And these two seem to be, man, you have the head. I, I, I think I should bring you to all my talks. Um, great. So now, as you can see, there's two cables here that are just hanging around. Um, this is just from preventing your head from exploding, so I'm just gonna flip them. <laughs> no, seriously, it's just, it, it, it's just ground, the electricity. Yeah. Um, next thing that I'm going to do is that I'm going to turn it on. Are you ready? Yep. <laughs> All right. uh, do you feel anything? Like, I feel the things. You shouldn't feel anything because it is a read only device, so it's only going to capture. <laughs> All right, so we have it turned on. If you don't mind just uh, standing up and just turning it around so they can see the little light here. I'm just going to open your skull real quick. There you go. All right, just turn it around. This is a little blue light, which means it's on, and it's working. OK, so you can sit down, relax. Uh, and yeah, uh, we're going to be reading your brain waves. And if you're relaxed, it's a very good thing, uh, because it's going to capture things like if you blink, uh, so you cannot blink for the next 20 minutes. <laughs> next, we have the dongle. The dongle is on right here. Probably you can see it, maybe not. Take my word for it. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to switch to my other screen. Um, here. There you go. And what you see is just a note, uh, the terminal. And I'm just going to start running my program that it's actually interacting uh, with the serial port via the OpenBCI SDK. Uh, we're going to start getting some data in, and I'm just going to be logging those samples, the, those data packets that I was telling you about. Um, there are two ways. You can just simulate data. That's not what we're going to do because we have a real person here. But if you run the NPM run simulate you uh, with this app, you can actually get simulated data that's coming from the SDK itself because developing, you not always want to be wearing the nerd hat. Um, and that just gives you some random data that you can actually use. Uh, but visualize. It's doing its thing. It's connecting on a fun board. It's building a project. All right, and there you go. Those are your brain waves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Minus zero means that there's not much going on in here. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's, um, we're going to get positive and negative voltage, and one is not better than, than the other. It's just energy, remember. So all of them seem to be moving fine, uh, which is very good. You can see how there's a lot of activity in channel one, because you can see uh, ranging from negative to positive voltage, and then zero, and then zero. Um, you can see how here in channel one, two, three, four, five, six, you're getting mostly positive voltage. And six maps to one, two, three, four, five, six to this one here. Uh, it probably means this part of your brain is a little bit more engaged than the other. Uh, slightly, because, you know, this is energy. Uh, great, so that's it. Um, I'm done here. Uh, we're going to be seeing each other soon now. Uh, I'm going to show you now how that looks visually. Uh, when an application, that is what I was telling you about, it's called the OpenBCI dashboard. It's an Android 2 application with Node, isomorphic JavaScript. Uh, where I'm using, or we're using a range of different data visualization tools and libraries, uh, like D3, Plotly, uh, Smoothie, Chart.js, WebGL, you name it. All right, so <coughs> let me open my app in port 42,000, and there you go. Right now, this is why it's called a time series. <coughs> Excuse me. You can actually see the voltage to the right, yeah, right here, right? Uh, you can see the electrical activity per channel, right? 
Um, actually, you can oh, I'll just scroll down. Yeah. Um, you can see the channel numbers, channel one, two, three, four, five. And then we have some options here, uh, some different charts. Uh, and I'm going to show you just what it looks like, and then we can get a little bit more into detail of like, what does this mean, right? This is what's called a frequency plot. This takes a buffer of data in a span of, let's say, one, two seconds, and it's going to be piped through a fast rate transform, FFT, which is going to basically get the frequencies out of this uh, uh, time series data, right? And then what's happening is that we're windowing, uh, meaning we're shifting the data as the buffer changes every X amount of samples. Um, so this is pretty real time. Um, if I were to like uh, take this out, you could see how it reacts right away. Are you thinking about something beautiful in life? Can you tell mm -hmm. us a little bit of what's happening up there? Crap. <laughs> Yeah. I can think of something if you want. Oh, there you go. You see how it changed when you were like thinking about thinking about something? <laughs> we also have a frequency radar, which is the same representation with yours in a circle of form. If you ask me why we built this one, it's just because it looks cool. It's the same data. Um, so, yeah. Actually, it might have some use. You, you, you can see the same data. <laughs> and then, this is one of my favorite parts, because this is when we start getting into different bands of frequencies. Uh, and these keywords might sound familiar to you. Who here knows what the frequency bands are when it comes to delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma? Can you raise your hands? You. The same guy who also, oh wow, man. You should probably. All right, awesome. What do you do for life? What, what do you do in life? I've used the neural sky. I've, I've been studying brainwaves. There's like music that you can change your brainwaves as well. That's awesome. Is that the, the brain app that uh, allows you to balance those one? One, one thing. Oh, the band. Yeah. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, isn't this way cooler though? Yeah, yeah, awesome. yeah that, that's what I wanted to hear. So, can you tell us what is the delta frequency band? So it's when you're relaxed. Yeah, so I mean the delta frequency band in, in essence is just a range of frequency. I believe it's like one to three hertz. Um, and usually it engages, it goes higher as you relax. Uh, the same way that we have theta, alpha, beta, and gamma, which is way higher. Um, the reason why there are eight bars is because we're doing this per channel. We want to know at the channel level, at the area level of your head here, um, the frequency band, <coughs> excuse me, uh, frequencies that we are getting. So if we see channel one here, we can see how the delta um, is going up and down, just like all the others, but they actually have some, uh, some rhythm. Um, I was demoing this at NGConf earlier this year, and um, Yuri Shaked, Sh Shaked uh, was uh, demoing another uh, science fair project that involves sound, uh, and it was just in the background, but it was this app, it was actually pretty cool, that uh, you would recreate some sounds pressing like four buttons, and they would have like different sounds. And it was in the background, and as I was showing people, I could see how some of the channels from particular parts of your brain were like engaged when they were hearing the sound, but they were actually not aware. This is this was happening at the sub subconscious level. Uh, so that is very interesting. It's like how you're getting something represented that has been is being captured without you maybe not being completely aware of that. And this is the power of of being able to get to read your brain electricity. I have two. Other type of visualizations that are in progress. Um, I'm not a huge fan of showing work in progress, but I can just tell you what I'm trying to do here because at the end of the day, this is an open source project. Everyone is involved. Uh, everyone is invited to get involved, uh, and I would love to hear your feedback. So, 
Um, I started working on a motion, uh, on a way that you can actually use the accelerometer data to try to move a 3D brain in WebGL. So right now, of course, it's not the same angle as the headset, but maybe if you tilt your head more, you can see a little bit of movement there. So that is an attempt there to try to angle a 3D object based on X, Y, and Z properties. Not there yet, but that's one of the things that I'm working on. Of course, what we really want is actually being able to see the electrical activity in a 3D brain-like object, right? So we can actually see more of what's going on. Uh, and that's something that is definitely something that we're going to be working on. And then we have a, topogra a topographic view, which is basically a map of the surface of your head, depending on where the, um, the most amount of energy is coming from. So uh, cold values are going to be like negative voltage. Um, hot values, like the red and oranges, are going to be more on the positive voltage side. Uh, and you sort of don't have a lot going on. There you go. You can see that. I just love doing that because of that all day. Yeah. 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 Uh, a little funky yet, still uh, a, lot, a long way to go to create real or useful visualization for research pur pur purposes. Um, the first time uh, I found out about this interface, I was like, oh, yeah, if it's open source, I'll get one, and I'm just going to read thoughts and control user interfaces. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, and yeah, it's, it doesn't work that easy. You really need to get deep into the science. Um, it's going to challenge you, and you need to learn about how the brain works. And it's just fascinating. It just gets deeper and deeper each time you're like trying to grasp some of these this concepts. There's so much to go here. And on the technological side of things, think about it. All the things that I mentioned at the beginning, um, IoT, machine learning, data science, isomorphic JavaScript, all these things are just part of this incredible opportunity that we have here, right? When you get really into the weeds, you're going to be working on, on the back end, on the front end. You're going to be doing Angular. You're going to be doing Bluetooth, probably serial communication, binary, you're going to be doing like a lot of math and algorithms. And like, I think this project has like almost everything that you can possibly do with it. Because we're talking about an infinite amount of possibilities about real-time data coming from the human body. Uh, and that is something that we have in the browser today. So I say we're pretty much in the future. Um, great, so that's the demo. Uh, stay there. Uh, and I want to talk about um, coding this, right? Let's talk about coding this. Actually, you're you're good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, I mean, you're invited to sit here. This is your spot forever if you want. But if you, if you want to go back, that's also fine. So. All right, that's completely fine. Sure. Yeah. Here, and then I can just like go. Take it? Yeah. Yeah. Great. <laughs> um, right. So let's see how we got to this point. I've been working on this project with the help of another uh, two, three developers. And uh, I, I, I had a, like huge ideas of what I wanted to do. I realized I couldn't do anything really with thoughts until we could do research and understand it better. So right now, I'm, we're at the stage of developing the tool that is going to help us do this. Right now, we can see a little bit of the data. It's kind of working. It could be better. Uh, but then we want to ab be able to conduct experiments. What type of experiments? There are many things. You, you name it. Um, since I work at Grubhub, I wanted to like just guess or just extract from your head what you wanted for lunch, right? Uh, because I don't know about you, but sometimes it takes a little bit more than one hour to decide um, what you want to eat. Uh, but before you can get there, you need to understand like what's happening inside here, right? So I, I think we'll get there. And 
the more people involved, of course, the better. Uh, I want to remind you this project is open source. It's in GitHub. Everything you've seen today, all the code is up there. Uh, and it's for you to steal and experiment. So adding functionality so you can conduct experiments and apply machine learning and hopefully exposing this in the cloud so someone in another country can actually get your data in real time and they can have experiments for that as well. This is from um, uh, medical research, of course. Uh, try to understand human behavior again. Now, let's see the code. Um, how many of you here are doing ES6 already? All right, that's, that's a very good number. That's like a third, maybe half. Awesome. So I was so excited when uh, the spec of ES6 was announced. Uh, and since this is kind of like my farm project, I'm going crazy. Uh, I'm already using Node 6, which was released a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, uh, while I was at Indicom. And um, I'm already trying to take uh, advantage of all, all of these features to make the development experience a lot better. Um, so the way I decided to architect this is that I, I wanted to extract things out and I wanted we could decouple it and then use it differently. So I created this concept of connectors. Connectors are what connect you know, um, your computer uh, to the interface. In this case, we have a couple of ways. Right now, we're using the serial ports, USB, right? So via node, that's the way we just saw it. Uh, we're getting data package from the serial port. But what about if this was not really necessary and we could just connect with Bluetooth directly? That could be another type of connector. So I start with a connector called serial port that leverages all of the APIs that the open BCI SDK has to offer, right? <coughs> um, we know that uh, Bluetooth is available in the web on the client, the front end right now, uh, if you enable the Chrome flag, right? So that could potentially be a connector in the future. Uh, of course, you want to probably uh, treat the data on the server side uh, so it's faster and we can also start applying all of our filters and all of our computations and our algorithms to the server side so it's already easier on the UI side. But we have connectors. Right now I'm going to be showing you a lot of connectors for serial port class looks like. We have some providers. Uh, providers is actually what provides us with something that we're going to be utilizing like a signal. So I'm going to be showing you the signal provider which is basically the data treated and piped filter and everything uh, so you're getting it. And then we have modules. Um, modules uh, are the different uh, algorithms that you can apply to an A signal. For example, FFT uh, or time series uh, or the topographic um, view and so many others, right? Uh, and then constants is just a place you know, where I'm saving some values in order to read them from multiple places, so nothing too fancy there. The reason why I'm using constant here for me at six is because we want to make sure uh, that connectors, uh, we cannot reassign it as a value, right? Uh, to the connector variable. Uh, it's, it's not making our data or our class immutable. It's just making sure that for some reason it's not reassigned. So you're going to be seeing a lot of constant here. Uh, so connector right now creates a new instance on the serial port class. Uh, and pass some options that are coming actually be passed to the OpenBCI for SDK. Then signal is a new uh, provider signal. So maybe switch the code and show you what a connector class looks like. It's actually pretty straightforward. Um, there you go. So this is the code. Can everyone read that? Should I make it bigger? Yeah, that's good. All right. Um, so this is the entry point of the application. As you can see, it's less than 30 lines of code. Um, and it's just requiring my connector providers some modules, <coughs> and it's basically initializing them. We have a connector start, and then we instantiate our modules, and we pass the signal reference. If you find this syntax a little funny, this is ES6 uh, deconstructing in, in ES6 which basically means you're creating a new object literal and you're passing a property that is going to have the value of the actual variable here. IO is sockets. We just require that as a dependency. Uh, in the same way, uh, in plain Java, in normal ES5 JavaScript, this would be signal. So it's kind of like a shorthand. 
you construct it pretty cool. Um, let's, let's check out the connector class. In my connectors here, I have the serial port and I have Bluetooth, but Bluetooth uh, is just the feature. There's nothing in it there. So for serial ports, um, we're using, of course, the OpenBCI SDK. <coughs> and we're using ESC's classes, but we're extending the OpenBCI board uh, class, which is coming from the SDK. The cool thing about this um, um, is that it looks cool when you do class serial port extends. Uh, we have a constructor, a constructor method for the class, and we're using super, super uh, to actually invoke the constructor of the OpenBCI board. Uh, you're going to find this in some classical languages. It's now in ES6. Um, and then we have basically two, three methods. We have start, we have stop, and we have stream. Uh, starts pretty much creates a new ESC promise uh, and it's going to invoke pretty much the out of fine OpenBCI board because the OpenBCI SDK has it as a function uh, that is going to try to loop through all of your available field port um, names and it's going to pick the one that looks like is, yeah, this is pretty much OpenBCI bundle. Uh, otherwise, we can just pass directly the name of the port, but that's no fun. Uh, ultimately, we're going to invoke the connect method. And why is it in this property? Because remember, this is a serial port, but it's extending OpenBCI board. So basically, I have a kind of like um, uh, an instantiation uh, of the OpenBCI board inheriting all of their APIs. Connect happens to be a method on the OpenBCI board SDK API. Um, and I have here some logic to see whether or not you're in simulation mode. Uh, oops, yeah. Uh, to see if you're in simulation mode so you can still use it uh, right now uh, without having to connect the actual device. Great, so we have stream stops, going to disconnect. And we have stream, which is pretty much going to invoke a callback you pass uh, on the event of when a sample packet is received. This is pretty much the entry point for us getting data, which is pretty cool. Because the next thing that is happening is that we are on the stream event, we are doing a signal buffer and a motion capture. Signal buffer takes care of distributing the data to all of our modules, FFT, topo, time series, um, and uh, we window in the data again, shifting uh, as we're getting it, kind of like a stream, right? And then motion capture is going to read from the different sample property called aux data that we talked about earlier. Uh, so these are two different providers. A motion is, in this case, a provider. Um, and if we see what the signal looks like, <coughs> we can see that the signal is just a class that I created. Uh, it takes IO in the constructor, so we can add it to our instance. Uh, but in here, you can also see that we're using event emitter. In ES6, the simple, cleaner way to uh, create an event emitter of your own is to extend the class event emitter uh, and then instantiating it and assigning it to a property on your class. And then we have a lot of very important properties in our, uh, for our signal. We have beams, we have buffer size, we have window refresh rate. What all these things mean is that how many samples do you want to collect until we can actually start windowing and start doing something with it? Because what's going to happen, let's say we're going to only take uh, 128 samples before we actually send it uh, to the front end via sockets, right? Just emitting events via sockets. Uh, buffer size as well. And then when the window refresh rate is like, after you get the first, let's say, two, one or two seconds worth of data, how many samples do you want to wait for until you do the buffering again? Uh, right now, I think we have around 8 or 16. So at 8 or 16, it's going to shift the last 8 or 16 uh, samples, and it's going to add the new ones. It's going to be piped. It's going to be filtered. And it's going to be broadcasted to their respective modules, FFT, time series, and topo. And they are going to be the ones in charge of emitting those events to the front end. So that's it in a nutshell. There are around 16 lines of code. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through everything. What I want to show you is the code on the front end. 
oh, actually, if I have, have five minutes. So I'm going to show you the content front end, uh, how we're getting this data and visualizing it in the browser. Um, I'm going to take uh, probably smoothie here, my time series on my app is time series right here. And we're going to see how what we're doing here is that we're importing from the API component life cycle, life, life cycles of Angular 2, uh, the component metadata, uh, element reference, to access the DOM, on an it, destroy. We're importing the shard, smoothie shard and time series. Uh, we're using sockets again. And what we're doing is that we're defining a component that has a selector, DCI time series. It has a template. Uh, the template looks like something like this. <laughs> the most important part here is that canvas ID. Uh, um, Smoothie works with canvas, so we are getting that canvas in our component, and what we're doing it is that we are making sure um, is uh, right here. We're doing times here in stream two that canvas, as you can see, and then. The socket event is picked up on the ng init, which means the component is ready to be used. Um, and we can see how on is going to be the name, the same name of the event that on the back end we're using to emit the data. We're listening to that same event. We're getting that data, uh, and when we're updating our own class, right, uh, amplitude's timeline, and uh, we're also appending the time series lines, which means that it's adding those time series visualization to the canvas. It's pretty cool. Uh, going back to the view, you can see here how we're using an NG4 to iterate through the channels, to the amplitudes that we're getting, and ultimately to the timeline, which is what says minus 18 seconds, seven, uh, 16 until zero, right? Uh, so that what uh, an Angular component looks like. I'm gonna switch back uh, to this, and we pretty much saw all of these are hot, are here, right? Um, we saw the add time, timelines. I just show you uh, with live code. Um, I wanted to add that with Plotly, which is a data visualization that uses D3 internally, it's actually even more simple. Um, you can do a Plotly new plot. Uh, you can have a plot element that references the native element from Angular 2. And then what you can do is that on the event, let's say for the topo, uh, then you can update the data Z property that is being passed actually uh, right here, this data, this data, that's the connection right here. Uh, it is passed and that actually live updates that topographic view and plotly just redraws and resizes just to make it responsive. So not a lot of code to make something very powerful happen. Um, Something very important for performance sake is that you want to make sure that to hook into ng destroy method of the Angular component lifecycle to make sure that you're removing listeners for, for sockets because a lot of listeners is not great uh, for the performance of your application. So that's just a couple of lines of code. Uh, for open source, I want to tell you that if you go to github.com slash newrjs, um, you can actually find this project and then other projects uh, that actually include uh, um, a neural trainer that I created, an experimenter app that still all of that is in early stages because there's just so much you can do. Uh, the top of grid dependency that actually uh, one of uh, the developers uh, that I've been working with created. Uh, I created Brainwaves Quick Start, which is actually the repo that you want to start with because in a very simple way, it, it sets you up with getting data on the browser so then you can do your own chart and visualizations. Uh, and I also have a blog post uh, on my website that walks you through how to set up your device uh, to start building something with it. And ultimately, DSP, some helpful uh, library that we forked and we've been contributing to. Uh, we're, we're around six people right now in the organization. You could be there too. Uh, you just need to uh, get involved with us. Uh, and let's start building something together. In review, we talk about neurotech, we talk about isomorphic JavaScript, data visualization and open source at a very high level, right? Because these are all topics that really deserve their own talk. Um, but for the future, we want to 
really get into data science, make sure um, that we understand what we're getting, and eventually maybe read thoughts. You can get involved by uh, going to meetup.com, New York Tech, NYC, uh, going to the repo, and also going to the OpenBCI community. And a special thanks to uh, these guys that have been working with me on all of this awesome stuff. This is definitely a team effort. So Q&A. Yes, <laughs> sir. So I was curious, besides uh, being able to like, read your thoughts and, and figure out what you might be doing, um, yeah. what sort of <laughs> examples are you uh, most excited about in the upcoming future in terms of uh, ways that most people can go around audiences? Yeah. So what other ways can we use this other than the ideas of like um, figuring out what to eat or whether or not you're, you're hungry? I have to say I'm very excited about helping people with disabilities do things, right? Um, there's so much that we can do on that area itself. It could help a lot of people. It, it, it actually, if, if you thought of accessibility by uh, doing code and making things accessible on the semantic side of things, imagine this. You can control a user interface with this. Maybe we don't need a mouse or a keyboard in the future. Maybe it's all coming from here and we don't have to do much. It's scary, but maybe, right? Do you think that's close in the future? If I think that's close in the future, uh, I want to say that I don't think it's, it's too close and I don't want, and it's not too far either. We got to the point where we can see it, now we have to train it, and I'm not going to start working on it until I'm satisfied and I think it's going to be a long time before that happens. Yeah. Yes, sir? Would increasing the electrodes to like 16 or 32 have higher resolution to see more differences? Yeah, the sir here is asking about the resolution, about the channel numbers from 8 to 16 or 32, yeah. So the OpenBCI team already uh, has a prototype with a 32 channel uh, with way higher resolution. Uh, that's something that's super important. Uh, if you go to the OpenBCI website, uh, openbci.com, you can see those prototypes. And they have uh, successfully kickstarted, funded and, and kickstarted uh, twice already. Yeah. Yes? Does OpenBCI sell the, the headsets, or do you have to 3D print them and sell them yourself? If OpenBCI sells the headset, or you can 3D print it, or you have to 3D print it yourself. Uh, yes, they sell the whole thing assembled, and they also sell you only the part that uh, you need in order to put together with a 3D printer. Uh, so it's going to just change the price, right? right. Uh, if you 3D print it yourself and assemble it, it's going to take you probably that one I assemble in like 16 hours only. Um, but you know, uh, then the prices go down because it's not work that they have to do, right? A little bit of manual level uh, labor involved. If you want to buy a sample ready to plug in, it's going to be a little more. It still, is under the one thousand dollar range. Uh, when, in like about three to four years ago, you needed to pay at least thirty thousand to get something like this. Yes. Is that the same as when you get like an electroencephalogram? Is that the same as when you get an electroencephalogram? Um, if you really test your yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you, are, you, are you talking about for like uh, EGG, yeah, right? Yeah, we have a doctor. Yeah. This is exactly an EGG reader, uh -huh. and you also get some EM, uh, MEG, uh, the the muscular <coughs> part of the signal. Yeah, yeah. Yes. One thing, I'm wondering if you figured out any like uh, human behavior patterns with it, like when we when we do something, some part of our if I have figured out any human behavior patterns. I can tell you that experimenting is not a lot of fun because when I try to see if I could measure hunger, uh, hunger, I got very hungry and I failed. <laughs> so I, I could see some of the frequency bands changing and I compare that to some research papers that I found from some medical doctors. Uh, not super consistent all the time. That's on the trainer and experimenting phase of, the, of this project. So not too much of that, but that's like definitely the next part. And that's like when things are going to get hardcore. Yeah. All right, so thank you so much, everyone.